Tonight's CBS Reports begins with this historic announcement by the Surgeon General of the United States on January 11th, 1964. It is a judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. That was three months ago. Today, the implications of this report to the nation's health and to its economy are just beginning to dawn. In the rural area, if we lose our tobacco, we're going to be hurting pretty bad now, that's for sure. If it would be a gradual process, we might, some can survive. If it comes all at once, uh, I think we're all going to go down to drink. At stake are the incomes of 750,000 families who farm the nation's fifth largest cash crop. The jobs of 96,000 men and women involved in tobacco manufacturing. The $8 billion a year tobacco industry, which pays more than $3 billion in federal, state, and local taxes, and $150 million worth of cigarette advertising with the ethical and moral problems it poses for all media, especially television. If a next door neighbor came to you and said to your son or your daughter, smoke, it's a good thing. Here, try this. It'll make you seem like a man. You'd probably throw him out of the house on his ear. Well, equivalently, persuasive advertising is doing something very, very similar. Well, you, you, you're dealing here with a very responsible uh, segment of our economy. And the people who are interested in the tobacco industry are just as interested in promoting and preserving and conserving the health of the American people as the average man of the street. If I thought that a democracy could, would always have money changers in the heart of the temple, uh, I would be a very unhappy woman. It seems to me that certainly a democracy above any and all forms of government should be able to set the public welfare at the center of every consideration. Here now is CBS News correspondent, Harry Reasoner. This is the exhibit hall at the annual convention of the National Association of Tobacco Distributors and some of the products being shown to these 6,000 wholesalers. Quite plainly, these men are not completely dependent on cigarettes. But equally plainly, anything that affects cigarette sales is big news to them. Last year, this country produced and distributed $8 billion worth of tobacco products. There are something like a million and a half retail outlets for cigarettes, many of which tempt smokers with everything from pens to playing cards. This is the size of the economic edifice that would be threatened by any substantial and permanent change in American cigarette smoking habits. Dr. Luther L. Terry, Surgeon General of the United States. My advice to the smoker would be to stop cigarette smoking. Uh, my advice to the person who has not started smoking is don't start. Tonight, we ask several questions. What has happened since the Surgeon General's report? Has there been, is there likely to be, any remedial action? And finally, what moral or ethical obligation does this pose to the United States government, the tobacco industry, the advertising agencies that promote the sale of cigarettes to the tune of $150 million a year, the newspaper, magazine, radio, and television stations and networks that carry this advertising, including the station and network you are now watching. The cigarette health controversy has caused a collision of interests on a grand scale. The forces of public health are attempting to change the smoking habits of 70 million Americans. The conflict was joined in the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. This agency was created by Congress in 1914 to protect consumers from deception by either the written or spoken word. After the Surgeon General's report, FTC Chairman Paul Rand Dixon proposed action. Well, we proposed uh, that either one of the following statements shall appear clearly and prominently in every cigarette advertisement and on every pack, box, carton, or other container in which cigarettes are sold to the public. Now, caution, cigarette smoking is a health hazard. The Surgeon General's Advisory Committee on Smoking and Health has found that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. 
or in a shorter form for television and radio, if someone would elect to do it. Caution, cigarette smoking is dangerous to health. It may cause death from cancer and other diseases. Then the, the second rule we proposed is uh, no cigarette advertisement shall state or imply by words, picture, symbol, sounds, devices, demonstrations, or anything else that smoking, the advertised cigarettes, promotes good health or physical well-being. And the third one is, uh, no cigarette advertisement shall contain any statement as to the quantity of any cigarette smoke ingredients, uh, an example, tars and nicotine, which has not been verified in accordance with a uniform and reliable testing procedure approved by the Federal Trade Commission. Mr. Chairman, you're talking about an $8 billion a year complex, about 750,000 farmers and a lot of other people working in the tobacco industry. In a case like this, in an action which might damage it, Will the commission get it backing from the administration? Well, I would uh, expect that the administration, sir, would expect us to do our job. During all the time that I've been here, I might say that uh, my experience is that the Federal Trade Commission is expected to do its sworn duties. The tobacco distributors who convened in Miami last week seemed unperturbed by the possibility that cigarettes might be labeled a health hazard. One of their principal speakers was Governor Terry Sanford of North Carolina whose state leads in the production of tobacco. As governor of one of the states, I share uh, with other governors many responsibilities. I share the responsibility for protecting the health of the people, and I take those responsibilities seriously. I'm also given many responsibilities to protect the economic health of my people, and I do not in any way minimize these responsibilities. Therefore, I am compelled to examine carefully the report to the Surgeon General and to enter conscientiously the effort to clarify the findings, to answer the questions raised, and to do it all in a way which does not adversely affect either the physical or economic health. The report says that no simple cause and effect relationship is likely to exist between a complex product like tobacco and a specific disease in the variable human organisms. This to me says exactly what many others believe, that this report raised a lot of questions but didn't find the answers. The tobacco capital of Governor Sanford's state is the city of Winston-Salem. Approximately one-third of the 523 billion cigarettes consumed in the United States last year flowed from the R.J. Reynolds plants of Winston-Salem. Chairman of the board of the largest bank in the city and state, Archie Davis, describes the economic significance of tobacco. It would be an understatement to say that tobacco is a big business here in this state. As a case in point, uh, during the past 10 to 12 years, I would say that the uh, total uh, value of our tobacco production annually has been in excess of $500 million. We have 165,000 farm families deriving most, if not all, of their income from the production of tobacco. Last year, they produced approximately 900 million pounds of so-called flu-cured tobacco. Now let's turn to the marketing process. The marketing process, at least 50% of it, is right here in the state. That means there's some 10,000 workers located here in North Carolina. Now to the manufacturing process. There's some 40,000 industrial workers and employees in our tobacco manufacturing companies located here in North Carolina. Of that number, approximately 15,000 are uh, connected with our uh, tobacco manufacturing uh, plants here in Winston-Salem. And today, the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company produces all of its products in one community. This company produces better than one-third of all the cigarettes produced in America. That one-third is produced within the corporate limits of Winston-Salem. Last year, we produced and shipped from our plants engaged in tobacco processing here in the state in excess of $3 billion worth of all types of tobacco products. Now, Quite obviously, 
this returns right much tax revenue to our state. But a matter of great significance to us here in this state is that 75%, or putting it more simply, 75 cents out of every general fund dollar received by our state is invested in education. So 75% of this tax money that I've just been speaking of goes in support of education here in our state. Winston-Salem is the leading manufacturing center for cigarettes, but the city of Wilson, North Carolina, is America's greatest marketplace for flu-cured tobacco, one of the major classes of tobacco now used in cigarettes. Last year, $50 million worth was sold in Wilson. Four of Wilson's tobacco farmers, including the county agent, W.D. Lewis, discussed their product with reporter Neil Cunningham. And down through the ages, this tobacco right here, American Blue tobacco that we raise, has been recognized around the world as having more quality and more aroma than any tobacco that's ever been raised anywhere. And a matter of fact, they tried all over the world to duplicate its flavor. But thank the Lord, up to now, they have not been able to duplicate its flavor. Do you feel that the people in the tobacco industry are worried about the effect of the Surgeon General's report? I don't think the people within the industry are too concerned, really, over the effect of the health scare. I mean, I believe they're going ahead, full speed ahead, to, to carry on their business as they have always before. And we as farmers want to maintain the, our standard of tobacco production to meet the needs of these companies. Lonnie, don't you think maybe, I think we're concerned about the possibility of anything which will be injurious to the public. But I think we are, are confident enough that the solution can be found. In the meanwhile, we are, we've got open minds as farmers. We're not panicky about it. We are going on about our business of trying to raise an, a better quality tobacco for our own markets and for the world market. we in a position that we don't want to directly deny the hazard of tobacco to health. We don't intend it to be that way. We don't want it to be that way. We definitely want to know more about it, and we certainly don't want to produce something or market it something that is a health hazard. As family men, how do you feel about your children smoking? Well, I have three kids, uh, one 19, one boy that's 17, and as yet they don't smoke. I will not encourage them to smoke. I will never encourage them to smoke. I don't think that it's good for you. I don't think it promotes anything. Uh, it's uh, a relaxation thing for me. I uh, smoke them uh, not after meals or any time uh, to relieve some ner nervous tension or something like that. I, I don't say it promotes any health at all, and I, I would never encourage young children to smoke. What would happen to Wilson if tobacco were to disappear rapidly? We don't want to think about it, because 50% uh, of the gross product in our uh, town is dependent on tobacco, and 75% of our farm income. And uh, when you think about uh, replacing uh, 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 roughly $21 million, uh, and half of it is for return on labor. Tobacco requires a, a lot of labor. Uh, there's just no way you can even figure it out with a piece of paper how to replace uh, that income. In the rural area, if we lose our tobacco, we're going to be hurting pretty bad now, that's for sure, uh, because we have always been accustomed to having this source of income. If it would be a gradual process, we might, some can survive. If it comes all at once, uh, I think we're all going to go down the drink. To the farmers of North Carolina, the Surgeon General's report represents one kind of threat. To the teenagers of Newton, Massachusetts, it represents another. Now, in the light of the Surgeon General's report on smoking, the report of the Royal College of Physicians, and other similar reports, I consider it completely unnecessary to go into the medical evidence against cigarette smoking. I will give you one statistic only. If present trends in smoking continue, then one million present school children in the United States 
will die of lung cancer before they reach the age of 70 years. Dr. Eva Salbert, senior research associate at Harvard School of Public Health, recently completed a four-year study of the smoking habits of 7,000 Newton junior and senior high school students. Recently, the South African-born physician led a discussion at Newton South High School. I'm sort of inclined to, to believe that this report will die out as a lot of other, the, uh, the other Senate investigating committees and uh, governmental reports. It uh, has an impact in the beginning, and a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to die if I don't stop smoking. I'm going to stop smoking. Um, I know several people who, as soon as the report came out, decided to stop smoking right then and there. But I look at the report as maybe a spark that sets off the flame. I think that now is the time to do something about what you've wanting, been wanting to do all along. And I also feel, as Chuck does, that if this report isn't continually repeated and stressed, that it may die out and people will just forget about it. Well, I don't think the report uh, strikes close enough to home. Uh, I admit that it probably will uh, discourage some smokers. But uh, in general, I think that unless a person uh, sees somebody who has been smoking for a long time and does develop a, uh, a very bad cough or does eventually develop cancer, that uh, I don't think it's going to do too much good. You see the advertisements on television, and smoking just seems to be the thing to do. And you see the attractive couples, you see them sitting on a beach, and they instinctively light up a cigarette. I mean, this is the thing to do. You see them walking in the country, and they can't take a walk in the country without a cigarette. The, the cigarette is an essential part of the picture. It completes the picture. The people smoking are always very attractive, very beautiful people, and they're the advertisements usually portray oh, either a very romantic setting or in sports sort of a very vir virile image of a man. And in, well, some advertisements have a man and a woman in a very, in a very romantic setting. And subconsciously you could think of yourself uh, in this place Basically, they say, well, if you smoke this brand, you'll have a new girl, a new job, you'll make $50,000 a year, and you'll be a water skier. Now, uh, <laughs> that, I think, has a, a great effect on the younger people. But uh, I think I was basically influenced by my parents and my uh, sister in the home life. Uh, my parents didn't make a great effort to stop me. They told me that uh, it wasn't good for me. The only thing they didn't want me to do was smoke in public. I feel it was more that my friends started smoking, and we did it to make ourselves appear older. When we were in junior high school, we looked up and saw the high school students smoking, and we wanted to associate ourselves with them. This, I think, is the main reason why I started. And it just became a habit that was hard to break, and I haven't as yet stopped. Later, we asked Dr. Salbert whether children reflect the smoking habits of their parents. I think this is the single most important reason for smoking of all. Children grow up watching their parents before they ever go to school. And their parents, after all, are their models. And they see their parents smoking around them. They see parents who have to go out in bad weather to go and buy cigarettes because they can't manage to get through the evening without them. We found in Newton that twice as many of the students smoked when both parents were regular smokers than when neither parent smoked. And it needed but one parent, whether father or mother, to bring that percentage up almost to the level of the both parents smoked. How many children do smoke? Well, it depends on the age you're talking about. And I can really only talk for Newton. But in Newton, in the seventh grade, one percent of the girls said that they smoked, and I think the percentage is probably higher than that, and seven percent of the boys. But by the time they had reached the senior grade at school, 46 percent of the boys admitted to smoking and 55 percent of the girls. So this is a considerable amount of smoking. Does this fit a kind of pattern of growing up so far as other activities are concerned? In other words, would they give the same kinds of reasons as to why they want to start wearing makeup or why they begin to drink a little? I would say that you could group the reasons into two general groups. And this is interpretation. This is not what the children told me. I think there are some children who start smoking early. 
And the reason they do this is because they haven't achieved as well at school. They don't get on as well with authority, whether parental or otherwise. And they need something to boost themselves in their own eyes and in the eyes of their fellow students. And the cigarette is so easy. And this becomes a kind of status symbol. Then you have another group, and I think this is the bigger group of the two. And these are the children who follow all current fashions. And smoking is the thing to do, and so they do it. I think they are uh, influenced a great deal by their parents in this and uh, by the advertising uh, media. The question of ethics in broadcasting and advertising has come increasingly to the fore in the cigarette health controversy. Father Thomas Garrett is the author of many publications dealing with business ethics and is professor of philosophy at the University of Scranton. Is it immoral for the media that carry cigarette advertising newspapers, magazines, television, which is licensed in the public interest, is it immoral for them to carry these ads? If the advertising were nothing but a simple picture of the package and the name of the product, I don't think we'd see any real moral problem. But when they start, let us say, to urge the young to use cigarettes, ah, we've got a problem. And notice, Mr. Reasoner, that in the last four or five years, there's been a shift in cigarette advertising with the appeals directed to the young. Let's put it this way. The man who drives the getaway car in a bank robbery is as guilty as the man who goes inside and holds the gun on the teller. And when you're cooperating as a media owner or writer, you're involved in it too. It's been suggested that the, uh, the real cigarette test for this country is the, to find out whether something which is so good for us economically and apparently so bad for our health whether this kind of an issue can be resolved in a democracy. Do you believe it can? Well, I believe it can be resolved, but I wonder if it will be resolved. And I'll tell you why. I I'm a little uh, cynical, as I said before. I'm afraid that there will be a big brouhaha, uh, smoke and fire, and the thing will die quietly off. And in between, I think the eyes of the public will have goof of dust scattered in them. May I give you an example of that? Last night, there was a commercial call for X cigarette. And it went something like this. We bring you an important message. X, uh, no other cigarette, according to any survey, is better medically than X cigarette. This is not a claim. This is a fact. Practically applied, it was a public service. If you analyze that, you'll see that that's pure, unadulterated, 100% goofy dust. It gives you the vague impression, maybe there's something good about this, and it tries to say poo-poo to all these reports. And I'm afraid we're going to have a rash of this type of counter-propaganda. Father Garrett, do you know advertising men who really believe that uh, smoking is not harmful to health, that the case hasn't been proven? Well, I don't know any of them, and... Uh, after all, they don't allow illiterates on Madison Avenue. Do you think that they see a moral situation? Uh, I would say most of them do, but I'm a little cynical in that some of the most uh, moral, shall we say, are those without cigarette accounts. <laughs> and I think we have to face this. Ogilvy, Benson and Mather is an advertising agency whose clients spend $65 million a year. Author of the recently published Confessions of an Advertising Man, the Scottish-born chairman of the board is David Ogilvy. He invented the man with the eye patch for Hathaway shirts, but he refuses to accept cigarette clients. We've handled two cigarette accounts in our day, but that was before the Royal College of Physicians report. We read the Royal College of Physicians report when it first came out. It seemed to us the conclusions were inescapable. We decided then, as a company, that we would not want to accept any cigarette advertising. We would not want to handle it. And when the Surgeon General's report came out, we, were con we uh, repeated that decision. What do you think about American cigarette commercials? Disgraceful. Uh, I watch these commercials. I see the handsome, 
athletic young man, drawing in a mouthful of cigarette smoke and then inhaling it down into his lungs. And I'm appalled to think that I belong to the profession which can perpetrate that kind of villainy. I see other cigarette commercials which are written by what we call in our business weasel merchants, which are essays in the art of casuistry. They're intellectually dishonest. The men who, know, who wrote them and who paid for them know it. Mr. Ogilvy, suppose you had to prepare an anti-smoking campaign. What are some of the techniques you might use? We would show admirable people who do not smoke, people that the young would want to identify themselves with. We might show some of the people who are addicted cigarette smokers and what miserable, neurotic fellows they're apt to be. And I, for one, wouldn't hesitate to show the youth and all viewers, once again, what it's like when you have terminal lung cancer, what sort of a way it is to get out of this world. Some ad spokesmen say, Whatever can be sold legally can be advertised legally. What do you think of this argument? Perhaps this all comes down in the last, uh, uh, to a matter of individual conscience. If there's an advertising man whose conscience is not troubled by advertising cigarettes, perhaps he can advertise them. If there's a network whose president's conscience is not troubled by taking money for his stockholders for running cigarette commercials, perhaps they can be run. Foot Cone and Belding is one of America's leading advertising agencies, and Fairfax Cone, the chairman of its executive committee, is regarded as one of the statesmen of his industry. He talked with CBS News correspondent Hughes Rudd. I don't think that advertising cigarettes per se is any more immoral than advertising anything else. I think any specific advertising might be immoral. I think... Uh, any specific advertising may be in questionable taste, it may be unethical, but simply to say that advertising cigarettes is immoral, I find that impossible to agree with. Well, the FTC seems determined to have cigarette manufacturers put some kind of a warning, in effect, almost a skull and crossbones on the package. How do you feel about that? I would feel, I feel that it's no different than if the auto manufacturers were forced to put a skull and crossbones on the inside of the windshield of every automobile they sold which is a lethal device under certain circumstances. Or if warnings were <clears throat> to be put on certain food products that uh, they, were, they were fattening, because if they're taken in too great amount, uh, these are injurious to health, too. What, what I object to about the Federal Trade Commission is that they have uh, seemed to go beyond anything that has been determined by the surgeon general or by any group of doctors. Uh, nobody has yet said, and this is the reason for my point of view, uh, these are the limits beyond which cigarettes are dangerous. We all know people who've smoked for, for many years without uh, ill consequences that we know anything about. This seems to me to make the thing far too universal, and I don't understand why if the manufacture and sale of cigarettes is legal, advertising shouldn't be legal too. And yet we already have regulatory laws, haven't we, uh, prohibiting an advertiser from making false claims or extravagant claims? We have uh, the Federal Trade Commission uh, undertaking to see that uh, false claims are not made. We have the better business bureaus over the country. But let me, let me say it to you once again, advertising is something people do. Advertising doesn't just get done by itself. And the people who do it, do it in their own image. Some of them aren't very nice people. Uh, happily, I think the majority of business people are, are both honest and uh, thoughtful. And I believe there is very little advertising which is uh, either deceitful uh, or, or dangerous. The National Association of Broadcasters is concerned with ethical standards in broadcasting. The NAB's Code of Good Practices is subscribed to by the television networks, 80% of the commercial television stations, and 38% of the commercial radio stations. The president of the NAB is Leroy Collins, former governor of Florida. He talked with CBS News correspondent George Herman. Very important self-regulatory efforts have been made by the tobacco advertisers. 
Uh, for example, they have discontinued uh, using the testimony of uh, sports heroes uh, that uh, would be expected to have a very strong appeal to youth. Uh, one major company announced uh, not so long ago that it would not uh, uh, sponsor any sports events because of a large uh, uh, accumulation of youth in the audience uh, that would be expected. All of these proposals seem to be aimed at young people. But is it moral to use advertising to encourage older people to continue smoking? Viewing this thing uh, from a, a personal point of view, uh, of course it would be far better if all people stopped smoking. And of course, uh, smoking cigarettes is injurious to people of all ages. But I think uh, there is a greater responsibility on the part of the broadcaster and the other advertising media in respect to advertising that specially appeals to the youth. Any advertising, of course, that's carried on, a child, some children are going to see, and some children are going to be impressed by. But as long as it's a legal product, well, then it's going to be legal to advertise it in some way. And uh, the, the point is that the need is to minimize the impact and the impression uh, upon the youngsters. And also, of course, to restrain the overall advertising program so that it will not mislead and so that it will not deceive, and so that it will not be false. Governor Collins, what does cigarette advertising represent to the television industry? Is it a major portion of TV income? Oh yes, indeed it is. In fact, I think cigarette advertising now ranks fourth uh, among the uh, major uh, advertisers uh, in television. Uh, the total dollar income to all broadcasting, the last figure I saw, was $140 million a year, or roughly 6.5% of all uh, advertising revenue. Yes, indeed, it is a very major source of income. Would we, uh, would the networks uh, be in deep difficulty if there were no cigarette advertising? I don't think uh, so, materially. Uh, there may be some loss, but I think by and large it will be made up uh, through uh, the sale of commercial time uh, for other commercial purposes. But even uh, if there is, in the end, some loss, uh, personally, I feel that it's going to be more than offset by a gain in integrity uh, and uh, a gain in the approval of this medium uh, by a grateful nation. This is a meeting of the NAB's Television Code Review Board. Though Governor Collins speaks as president of the NAB, many broadcasters disagree sharply with his views. Broadcasting Magazine once said of him, no one can be called a leader if he marches down the street by himself. Nevertheless, the board recommended code changes which have since been adopted. One amendment would go under the uh, programming section of the code and would uh, deal with the importance that, that care should be exercised in, so that cigarette smoking, in effect, uh, would not be depicted in a manner that would uh, impress the youth of our country as a desirable habit worthy of imitation. This would deal with programming, program content. The other proposed recommendation of the Code Review Board uh, is in the advertising section of the code, and it deals with the advertising of cigarettes uh, and not being presented in a manner to convey the impression that, this, that cigarette smoking uh, promotes health or is important to the personal development of the youth of our country. Uh, you have to consider uh, realistically how far you go in a voluntary self-regulation effort uh, to attempt to eliminate a product which still is a legal product and a very highly popular product and it'll probably continue to remain so. Do you imply that you disagree with the FTC proposal as being too strong? Uh, it's our general view, I think, that if the proposals of the Federal Trade Commission with, res uh, with respect to their restrictions on tobacco advertising were adopted as they are proposed now, there wouldn't be any such thing as tobacco advertising as a result of which any action on our part might be entirely academic. One independent radio station has taken an unprecedented action. Hi there, wide wide we will see your leader VMR scooter jumping with my hat in my hand, a swing with the hits for the next four hours, the home of the hits, Radio WMCA. Now the rest of the good guys, Jack and Dan and Harry and Joe, have spent the day with Mom getting popped back to work, you know. And I look traffic snarl. This, this young man is B. Mitchell Reed, a disc jockey for radio station WMCA in New York City. President of WMCA is R. Peter Strauss. 
We dropped cigarette advertising from the B. Mitchell Reed Show because, as we said at the time, in a letter to the advertising agencies who were concerned, we felt that this program is the only one on our air which makes a special appeal to young people. And we thought it was our responsibility as broadcasters and indeed as citizens to keep this program free of anything which we thought might have an adverse effect on the health of the young people to whom this program makes a special appeal. One government which has tried to reduce the appeal of cigarettes is that of Great Britain. In March 1962, the report of Britain's Royal College of Physicians rocked that nation with an incrimination of cigarettes similar to the Surgeon General's report. Since then, England's commercial television network has permitted cigarette advertising only after 9 p.m. To Robert Platt, former president of the Royal College of Physicians. Well, I think there's been a very big change in the attitude of the public towards this question. People do accept the evidence. I think there are evidences, for instance, that uh, the tobacco manufacturers really accept the evidence. People are no longer trying to uh, pretend that it isn't there. It has to be admitted that the effect on the smoking habits of the general public has been disappointingly small. It fell, I think, by about 10%, and then it's gradually crept up towards its former level. How effective has the anti-smoking campaign been through the posters, the anti-smoking clinics? Well, I think one's bound to say disappointing. In the first place, I think you, you, one realizes more than ever before how powerful this addiction is. And it is no good calling it anything else but an addiction. And anybody who's really had it knows how frightfully difficult it is to give up cigarette smoking. I think it's uh, not much good appealing to fear. I think it arouses a sort of uh, counterattack on part of the person's personality which is being attacked in this way. Because I think we have got to do something about this. I think we can't just let you know, 20,000 really unnecessary deaths from cancer of lung just go on in this country. In this country, the first government action following the Surgeon General's report was taken by the Federal Trade Commission on January 18th when it announced its proposed new rules to regulate cigarette advertising and labeling. Public hearings were held in March, and the Commission's record was to be kept open for the filing of written statements until today, April 15th. But yesterday, the FTC announced that it was extending its deadline until May 15th. At the public hearings in March, the FTC proposals drew strong criticism from the Tobacco Institute, whose membership includes the major cigarette manufacturers. Speaking for the Institute, H. Thomas Oster. This commission it does not have the legal authority to proceed in these rules as it is endeavoring to proceed. Second, in view of the wide-ranging public, social, and other interests in this problem, that whatever ought to be done should be developed by the Congress. In addition to that, I hope to get this afternoon to the point of indicating that since the issuance of the advisory report to the Surgeon General, the industry itself has been developing cigarette guidelines. When they're crystallized, they will be presented to this commission and to every other agency of the federal government. And uh, finally, with respect to one of the bases on which the commission is proceeding, it seems to belie the facts in the sense that it assumes that the American public is not cognizant, has not been made aware of the problem of smoking and health. And uh, we have some suggestions which we will venture uh, in that area. Senator Maureen Newberger also testified. I'm most concerned about the cynical attitude of the tobacco industry, that uh, they don't want the Federal Trade Commission to issue any uh, regulations that are uh, going to fear with the economy, as they call it, of the industry. Well, I have admit everywhere that uh, this is a, a big uh, multi-billion dollar industry in our country. But nevertheless, I think uh, 
it's a pretty cynical attitude if we don't take a, a certain amount of consideration for the fact that the health and welfare of 190 million Americans is at stake. The American Newspaper Publishers Association, whose membership includes 880 dailies in the United States and Canada, carrying about $15 million worth of cigarette advertising, attacked the proposed regulations on such advertising. General Consul Arthur Hansen. We stated up there that the basic question as presented to us was whether or not the Federal Trade Commission had been given the power by the Congress of the United States to promulgate substantive trade regulation rules which would limit the freedom of advertisers and inescapably the freedom of all advertising media. And obviously, as the Daily Newspaper Trade Association, representing the people whom we represent, we feel that we have a trust from the people of the country to carry out the provisions of the First Amendment to the Constitution as it affects free speech and the freedom of the press. Most critical of radio and television advertising was the representative of the Consumers Union, Mrs. Mildred Brady. The continued advertising of, of, of cigarettes on those media that have such great influence with the young, television and radio, this, I think, can no longer be tolerated. Uh, television and radio do intrude into our homes. We buy the sets, we own the sets that you use. Without them, there would be no media. Uh, you use the airways, which are a public domain. And it does seem to, and when Congress gave these airwaves to private broadcasters, uh, they were giving the children of the nation over into your keeping. And uh, I don't see how uh, this right and privilege given to this industry uh, can justifiably be used to damage the children of the nation. So are these two, are these two media no advertising. The Roy Collins of the National Association of Broadcasters. Now, our association uh, went into that proceeding before the FTC and took the position that uh, the FTC had not been given by the Congress adequate authority to do what it was proposing to do. Now, now this position was taken aside from the merits or aside from the need of curtailment in uh, cigarette uh, advertising but based upon the very solid position that the FTC should not be allowed to proceed unless it had adequate authority to do that. After the hearings, Chairman Dixon answered that charge. Well, I've uh, answered this question before. We would not have adopted such a proceeding had we not been convinced that we did have authority to issue such a general trade rule. But I am fully aware of the uh, system under which we operate, that no matter what we do, we are subject to judicial review. If we were to issue a, uh, a rule such as we're talking about here, just as Mr. Ostrin has been recently testifying to, the very rule itself could be challenged in the court at that time, and I would assure him if it's challenged, we'll take it right on up. We asked Father Garrett if he favored the FTC's proposal to label cigarettes as a health hazard. What I'm afraid is, Mr. Reasoner, that this may be used as an excuse for doing nothing else. You know, we've been good boys, uh, we've labeled them, the public is warned, and now let it drop. And human beings being what they are, it will drop. And people will go on just as they are with uh, the printing down there at the bottom of the pack and no continual reminder of what's really at stake. To protect the nation's health, and to protect an economy bolstered by $3 billion in cigarette taxes? That seems to be the question. Governor Albertus Harrison, Jr. of Virginia. We have an industry which uh, has made this country really a great and a good and a powerful nation, which contributes to our national defense, which enables us to have a foreign aid program, which enables us to have tremendous welfare and public health programs, which provides uh, revenues for the states, which uh, enables the communications media, very television itself, uh, to provide entertainment for millions of people. We must have an accommodation between our obligations to protect the health of the American people on the one hand, and our obligation to an industry, which means so much to the American people. And for one, I believe that the answer to it is through research. If there be anything in a cigarette that's harmful, 
there's no doubt in my mind that that thing can be discovered by doctors, by uh, research people, and that the tobacco industry will eliminate it. Dr. Carey, the possibility of developing a safe cigarette. Actually, I do not believe that there is any scientific evidence today to lead us to believe that a safe cigarette will be developed in the immediate future. Dr. Terry, what has happened in the country since your report of the Surgeon General on cigarette smoking was released? The first major impact that one saw was that a lot of people who were smoking ceased smoking. Others uh, cut down on the amount of smoking uh, that they were doing at the time. In addition to that, there has been action on the part of certain of the voluntary health organizations as well as, as the other organizations to disseminate this information as a, an educational and informational campaign in the field of health uh, to the people of this country. And uh, there also have been certain activities in relation to increasing the amount of research which is done on the subject. Because I think the report, for instance, though it had some very positive findings in certain respects, left certain scientific questions uh, in the air, so to speak, and therefore uh, we feel that there are, is a necessity for more research to uh, determine certain of these factors. Some people say that it's just circumstantial evidence, it's just statistics. Well, I think those are people who are not willing to face up to the fact. Frank, frankly, I find the, the statistics overwhelming. In the light of the statistics, the American Cancer Society has launched an educational campaign warning of the dangers of cigarette smoking although as yet its anti-cigarette expenditures are on a much smaller scale than the tobacco industry's advertising and promotion. The society has made its first efforts to compete with the expensive cigarette commercials on television. Its star, basketball hero, Bob Cousy. Bob Cousy, scene five, take one. I keep telling players to do everything they can to stay in the best possible condition. That's important, not only in basketball, but for life in general. That's why I urge young basketball players not to smoke cigarettes. So if you smoke now, cut it out. If you haven't started smoking, don't. To stay in top condition, cut out cigarette smoking, not only for basketball, but for life. Science has now proven a connection between cigarettes and lung cancer. Get the facts from the American Cancer Society. Most of the Cancer Society's educational campaign is aimed at students like the young people of Newton, Massachusetts. They ought to have more uh, restrictions on letting younger children buy cigarettes because I know that I never had any trouble when I was in the sixth and seventh, eighth grade buying cigarettes. You just walk in, you ask for a packet of cigarettes and they give them to you. Or you can go up to a machine, put in your 30 cents or your 35 cents and you get your cigarettes. I think you have to wake up one morning and say, smoking is bad and I'm going to stop today. Throw out your cigarettes, your matches and everything else and forget about smoking. Just know that it's bad for you you have, it's something you have to do. There are plenty of things in life that you, you don't want to do, and yet you have to. And this is one of them if you want to have a healthy life, and you have to realize this, want to do it, and make the break and do it. The major cigarette manufacturers are among the 15 members of the Tobacco Institute Incorporated. When Cigarettes, a Collision of Interests was announced as the title of this broadcast, the president of the Tobacco Institute, former U.S. Ambassador George V. Allen, objected, as he explains. This program has been billed as a collision, a potential conflict of interest between the nation's physical well-being and its economic health. I object strenuously to this sort of either-or, even good guys and bad guys presentation. Its premise is that the tobacco industry, people in the tobacco industry, have no interest whatsoever in the public health of the nation. If there are such people, uh, they are extremely short-sighted. The people I know in the tobacco industry uh, are vitally interested in the public health aspects of this question. Uh, they, the tobacco people are doubly so. Uh, first, as human beings, uh, naturally interested in their own health and that of their fellow man. But also, uh, they obviously want to find out what the answers are to these questions which have been raised with regard to their product. The tobacco industry has spent more time and money on scientific investigation of 
smoking and health. Uh, they spent millions on that subject. Uh, recently, $10 million was given to the American Medical Association for this very purpose. Uh, with no strings attached whatsoever. And three out of the five members of the committee of the AMA, which will direct this research, were members of the Surgeon General's Committee, which made the famous report last January. I know of no industry in the United States which is making a, a greater effort in time and money in an objective evaluation of its own product. Now, if there's something in smoking uh, that is causally related to uh, any kind of cancer or other disease, we want to find out what it is, and the sooner the better. If it's something in tobacco or the smoke uh, that is the uh, causative factor, uh, that can be remedied. If there's some other cause, such as smog or auto exhaust or viruses or a combination of these, that can be taken care of. Physical well-being and economic health are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. Our economy is not likely to thrive unless our people are healthy. Let's turn the scientists loose on this question and let the chips fall where they may. Quitting smoking is an old American hobby, a joke and a goal ever since the habit began. But since January 11th, since the Surgeon General's report, it has achieved a new urgency and a new respectability. The 6,000 wholesalers at this convention are uncomfortably aware that cigarette sales slumped in January and February and have now rebounded. We may be seeing a repetition of the British experience, a return to normal heavy consumption after an initial fright. But whether sales fall, rise, or remain the same, whether there is congressional pressure or long litigation, our free enterprise system faces one of its sternest trials. President Collins of the National Association of Broadcasters expressed it this way. If you had it within your power that uh, you could keep people from ever getting sick again, uh, would you do it because that would put a lot of doctors out of work and a lot of hospitals out of business and a lot of pharmaceutical uh, people would suffer e economic loss? That's a rather ridiculous thing, but still the principle is the same. And certainly everyone would say, no, if we can get people well, if we can keep people well uh, without all of these other things, well, that is our obligation. That which is good for the state of our economy is not, in the opinion of most medical authorities, good for the state of our health. The real test is how we cope with this knowledge. It is one small way by which we measure the effectiveness of a free society. This is Harry Reasoner for CBS Reports. Good night. CBS Reports, Cigarettes, A Collision of Interests, was filmed and edited by the staff of CBS Reports under the supervision and control of CBS News.